whenever somebody says cat, that's how we retrieve it. And that's essentially what they're doing. And that's uh, the, uh, the goal of general AI is to be able to learn from, uh, it, it's even the goal of machine learning AI. It's, it's to learn from multiple iterations of something. Okay. Hi, welcome to Help Me Understand. I'm Dr. Thomas Jeffrey, and my background is researching artificial intelligence and its impact on society and the individual. So let's, let's take a look at this video. The video is from Vox and see how it explains how art is being done using artificial intelligence. Caterpillar. A dancing tackle. My prompt is Salvador Dali painting the skyline of New York City. You may be thinking, wait, AI-generated images aren't new? You might have heard about this generated portrait going for over $400,000 at auction back in 2018, or this installation of morphing portraits, which Sotheby sold the following year. It was created by Mario Klingemann, who explained to me that that type of AI art required him to collect a specific data set of images and train his own model to mimic that data. Let's say, oh, I want to create landscapes, so I collect a lot of landscapes. So, in a lot of ways, they are trying to mimic how humans do things. We categorize, we, uh, we accommodate by new things by trying to um, put them into categories that we already have. And so in our minds, what we're doing is exactly what they're talking about, which is capturing those key frames or those uh, keywords and that's associated with that. So how do we learn even, let's say, cat? Well, we associated over time many, many different images to cat. And so whenever somebody says cat, that's how we retrieve it. And that's essentially what they're doing. And that's uh, the, uh, the goal of general AI is to be able to learn from um, it, it's even the goal of machine learning AI. It's, it's to learn from multiple iterations of something. Okay. Give images, I want to create portraits. I train it on portraits, but then the portrait model would not really be able to create landscapes. And same with those hyper-realistic fake faces that have been plaguing LinkedIn and Facebook. Because right now, AI does what we train it to do or how we program it to do. It's not inventing itself. Yet. Those come from a model that only knows how to make faces. Generating a scene from any combination of words requires a different, newer, bigger approach. Yeah, now we kind of have these huge models, which are so huge that somebody like me actually cannot train them anymore. Not only can you not train them anymore, but you have no idea what's going on. Even if you were the original programmer, if anybody comes in behind you, and that's what we, and multiple people come in behind, and that's when we get to the idea of the black box. The black box scenario being, we have no idea what's going on inside there. Anyway, this is sort of fascinating, though, how they got their there. Or on their own computer, but once they are there, they are really kind of, they contain everything, I mean, to a certain extent. What this means is that we can now create images without having to actually execute them with paint or cameras or pen tools or code. The input is just a simple line of text. And I'll get to how this technology works later in the video, but to understand how we got here, we have to rewind to January 2021. That's when a major AI company called OpenAI announced DALI, which they named after these guys. They said that it could create images from text captions for a wide range of concepts. And they recently announced- As long as the line they didn't highlight was expressible and natural language. So again, it all goes back to that, that keyword. And if you think about the networked, uh, let's just talk about the cloud, right? The, the networked computing that we have all around us today, I've only had experience of my lived experience. Now, I can talk to somebody else and get a, a, a certain perspective, but these machines, they can access anything that has been digitized and is uh, accessible via the computed network. So we're talking about millions, if not billions of images, where maybe in my lifetime I see a billion images, eh, two billion. 
on Stolly 2, which promises more realistic results and seamless editing, but they haven't released either version to the public. So over the past year, a community of independent open source developers built text-to-image generators out of other pre-trained models that they did have access to. And you can play with those online for free. I'm actually more impressed with the uh, technical piece, the, the how, how they can take all these different images, edit out the pieces that they don't want or that they need, and then have that, ma have that machine, uh, I guess, um, decide which piece is, so if it's a, a monkey and then there's a cap, but it's a person with a cap on, how does, it, it, it must be able to recognize cap be able to get rid of the, the person wearing it and then paste it into the, on, onto the monkey's head and, and then clean it up. That to me is impressive. Some of those developers are now working for a company called Midjourney, which created a Discord community with bots that turn your text into images in less than a minute. Having basically no barrier to entry to this has made it like a whole new ball game. I've been up until like two or three in the morning, just, you know, really trying to change things and piece things together and it's on about 7,000 images. It's just ridiculous. Midjourney currently has a wait list for subscriptions, but we got a chance to try it out. Perfect. Now go ahead and take a look. Oh, wow. That is so cool. Mm -hmm. That's pretty yeah, impressive. Yeah. Yes, he has some work to do. I, I, I feel like it, it, it can be, it's not dancing and it could be better. Yeah. The craft of communicating with these deep learning models impressive. has been dubbed prompt engineering. What I love about prompting, for me, it's kind of really, it, it has something like magic where you have to know the right words for the, for the spell. You realize that you can uh, refine the way you talk to the machine. It can become like kind of a... If I'm understanding it right, it's, it's not so much magic. Well, the magic is how fast computers can process and execute things. Nonetheless, it is very interesting. Dialogue. You can say like Octane Render, Blender 3D. Made with Unreal Engine. Certain types of film lenses and cameras. 1950s, 1960s. Dates, dates are really good. Lino cut or wood cut. Coming up with funny pairings like Fabergé Egg McMuffins. A monochromatic infographic poster about typography depicting Chinese characters. Some of the most striking images can come from prompting the model to synthesize a long list of concepts. It's kind of like a, it's having a very strange collaborator to bounce ideas off of and get unpredictable ideas back. Now, I like that, the, the idea of collaborating to get ideas. Um, but it, and the more words that you throw at it, the more possibilities are going to come out of it. And I think one of the things so far that I'm missing from this is the emotional side, the psychological part of art, that, um, that when an artist renders something or, or is putting something out there, it's a representation of their being, of who they are, as opposed to just going through uh, you know, a, a million. And people used to do this with catalogs. I mean, back in the old days, people would take catalogs and cut them apart with scissors and paste all, you know, make a collage. And that's what this really is. I'm not saying it's not impressive technically. And to the degree that once you have that many options, like they're showing us the best of how many, <laughs> you know. I love that. My prompt was Chasing Seafoam Dreams, which is a lyric from the Ted Leo and the Pharmacist song by Musicology. And I use it as the album cover for my first album. <laughs> All right. Yeah, not bad, interesting. For an image generator to be able to respond to so many different prompts, it needs a massive, diverse training data set, like hundreds of millions of images right. scraped from the, the internet along matters. with their text descriptions. Those captions come from things like the alt text that website owners upload with their images for accessibility yep, and for go. search engines. It's all about language so that's how engineers get these giant data sets. But then what do the models actually do with them? We might assume that when we give them a text prompt, like a banana inside a snow globe from 1960, they search through the training data to find related images and then copy over some of those pixels. But that's not what's happening. Oh, the new wrong. generated image doesn't come from the training data. It comes from the latent space of the deep learning model. That'll make sense in a minute. First, let's look at how the model learns. 
If I gave you these images and told you to match them to these captions, you'd have no problem. But what about now? This is what images look like to a machine, just pixel values for red, green, and blue. You would just have to make a guess, and that's what the computer does too, at first. But then you could go through thousands of rounds of this and never figure out how to get better at it. Whereas a computer can eventually figure out a method that works. That's what because deep learning does. Somebody In order to understand that this arrangement of pixels train. is a banana and this arrangement of pixels is a balloon, it looks for metrics that help separate these images in mathematical space. So how about color? If we measure the amount of yellow in the image, that would put the banana over here and the balloon over here in this one-dimensional space. But then what if we run into this? Now our yellowness metric isn't very good at separating bananas from balloons. We need a different variable. So let's add an axis for roundness. Now we've got a two-dimensional space with the round balloons up here and the banana down here. But if we look at more data, we may come across a banana that's pretty round and a balloon that isn't. So maybe there's some way to measure shininess. Balloons usually have a shiny spot. Now we have a three-dimensional space. And ideally, when we get a new image, we can measure those three variables and see whether it falls. Okay, so I wasn't that wrong. Idea of what's happening, the best that I understand, is that that categorization I was talking about earlier about what makes a cat. Well, you have input, we have input from others, so point at, you know, we're that big and we point at a dog and say, mommy cat or daddy cat. And uh, mommy or daddy says, uh, no, that's, that's a dog. And maybe explain why it's a dog. And so over time, it's, it's, it's learning, it, it, they're training it to learn in the same way we did uh, with multiple variables uh, at play. The space. But what if we want our model to recognize not just bananas and balloons, but all these other things? Yellowness, roundness, and shininess don't capture what's distinct about these objects. We need better variables, and we need a lot more of them. That's what deep learning algorithms do as they go through all the training data. They find variables that help improve their performance on the task, and in the process, they build out a mathematical space with way more. So it's breaking it down into the smaller um, concepts so for instance, a cat and a dog both have four legs, they both have fur, they both have you know, a tail. But it, how it's, you could say maybe it's the ears or it's how the cat's shape is, um, uh, the shape of the head uh, in, in conjunction with the ears. Those variables help us to, to better uh, make distinctions, which is what they're saying here. And it's incredible that they have done this. I mean, don't get me wrong in three dimensions. We are incapable of picturing multidimensional space, but Midjourney's model offered this, and I like it. So we'll say this represents the latent space of the model, and it has more than 500 dimensions. Those 500 axes represent variables that humans wouldn't even recognize or have names for, but the result is that the space has meaningful clusters, a region that captures the essence of banananess, a region that represents the textures and colors of photos from the 1960s, an area for snow and an area for globes and snow globes somewhere in between. Any point in this space can be thought of as the... So almost breaking it down to the pixel and the relationship of pixels. Interesting. Recipe for a possible image. And the text prompt is what navigates us to that location. But then there's one more step, translating a point in that mathematical space into an actual image in pixel space involves a generative process called diffusion. It starts with just noise and then over a series of iterations, arranges pixels into a composition that makes sense to humans. How does it? Because of some randomness in the process, it, it will never return exactly the same image for the same Somebody prompt. Somebody says, you got it. And if you enter the prompt into a different model designed by different people and trained on different data, you'll get a different result because you're in a different latent space. Yeah, now that's, that's impressive. No way! That is so cool, what the heck? The like brush strokes, the color palette, that's fascinating. I wish I could like, I mean, he's dead, but like up to me, like, look what I <laughs> Oh, that's pretty cool. Probably the only dolly that I could afford any. <laughs>
Well, tell us how that the works. The ability of deep that's... learning to extract yeah. patterns from data means that you can copy an artist's style without copying their images, just by putting their name in the prompt. James Gurney is an American illustrator who quickly became a popular reference for users of text-to-image models. I asked him what kind of norms he would like to see as prompting becomes widespread. I think it's only fair to people looking at this work that they should know what the prompt was and also what software Good luck was with used. That. Also, I think the Data artists privacy. should be allowed to opt in or opt out of having their work that they worked so hard on by hand be used as a data set for creating this other artwork. James Gurney, I think he was a great example of being someone who was open to it, started talking with their artists, but I also heard of other artists who got actually extremely upset. The copyright questions regarding the images that go into training the models and the images that come out of them are completely unresolved. And those aren't the only questions that this technology will provoke. The latent space of these models contains some dark corners that get scarier as outputs become photorealistic. It also holds an untold number of associations that we wouldn't teach our children, but that it learned from the internet. If you ask for an image of a CEO, it's like an old white guy. If you ask for images of nurses, they're all like women. We don't know exactly what's in the data sets used by OpenAI or MidJourney, but we know the internet is biased toward the English language and Western concepts, with whole cultures not represented at all. In one open source data set, the word Asian is represented for the If nothing else, it exposes all of the elements of society that maybe we should be thinking about. I mean, you know, the Asian thing for one, but also if we think of privacy and, and a person's style of doing something, that, that comes, it's not that pe people don't mimic it, but when you take that person's style and you can apply it to something else, uh, you're really taking that person's technique, and, and even though you may not be taking their art, you're taking the uniqueness of their technique and something that's very, I, I, I would say, private. So where does it end with, with data privacy? First and foremost, by an avalanche of porn. Yeah, it really is just sort of a infinitely Absolutely. complex mirror, you know, held up to our society and what we deem worthy enough to you know, put on the internet in the first place and how we think about what we do put up. But what makes this technology so unique is that it enables any of us to direct the machine to imagine what we want it to see. Uh, party hat guy, space invader, uh, caterpillar, and a ramen bowl. Prompting removes the obstacles between our ideas and images, and eventually videos, animations, and whole virtual worlds. We are on a voyage here that is um, it's a bigger deal than, than just like one decade or the immediate technical consequences. It's a change in the way humans imagine, communicate, work with their own culture, and that will have long range. We won't be able to anticipate, but one of the uh, issues that I'm coming across more and more is we're just fascinated by what's happening. We're, we're, no one really wants to think about the consequences. No one really wants to think about, well, should we even be doing this? And what impact is it going to have? Um, if, it doesn't matter what age you are, unless you're in the field of AI, you ask, if, you know, if you're an older generation, ask a younger generation, what is AI? And they probably have as, as little perception of what it is and, and how it works as, as you do. Even within the field, because it's such a narrow discipline based on engineering, they're not ha it, very few are doing multi multidisciplinary impacts. So what does this mean to society? What does it mean to the individual, our, our cognitive uh, we're, we're giving up so much in a trade-off with technology that we're not even aware of. But it is impressive and artistic, I guess I'll give it that.